Let's review the advantages and disadvantages of MR imaging compared to CT. Some of MRI's advantages are its ability to provide much richer characterization of soft tissue than CT, its ability to capture motion with time-resolved imaging, and the absence of ionizing radiation, which can be of particular concern for younger patients. However, there are also situations where MR underperforms CT. The spatial resolution of MR images is poorer. It's more susceptible to motion artifact, and image distortion can sometimes be quite bad near metal or at air soft tissue interfaces. The basic science between behind how CT and MR images are derived is totally different. While CT is based on a pretty straightforward principle that X-ray beams get blocked by different amounts by different materials, MR is basically is based on a totally different principle, imaging hydrogen atoms. That means you can't see things well on MRI if they don't have lots of hydrogen atoms inside of them. So uh, while substances like water and fat are densely packed with hydrogen atoms and can be visualized quite nicely on MRI. Substances like bone, which contain much fewer hydrogen atoms, are very hard to see. Lung is also very tough to see on MR imaging since lungs are mostly basically nitrogen and oxygen filled. And what soft tissue exists is always near an air soft tissue interface. So with lungs, you're dealing with a double whammy when it comes to seeing um, them on MRI. When we look at any CT image, um, this image is composed of thousands of pixels and every pixel of this image is painted with a shade drawn from a grayscale, grayscale spectrum that ranges from black to white. Materials like bone are painted with white pixels from the top of this spectrum, while materials like fat are painted with almost black pixels from the bottom of the spectrum. Um, and soft tissues like liver, muscle, or fluids like blood are painted with pixels that are some level of gray in the middle of the spectrum. Most medical professionals and laypeople intuitively grasp that the grayscale spectrum we use to paint CT images is a representation of density, uh, which is almost true. We say almost because the grayscale spectrum we use to paint CT images is actually a representation of different tissues' abilities to block X-ray beams, which is directly tied to their electron density, or basically how many electrons are packed within a given space. It just happens that a lot, but not all of the time, denser tissues tend to have higher electron density. So CT images, they're just basically electron density maps. And it's important for us to have this more nuanced perspective that CT images are electron density maps and that all CT machines basically do is create electron density maps of the body. And they don't do um, any other property of matter. So they're basically a one trick pony, um, if you will. MRI machines by comparison are a pony that can do many tricks, able to create image maps of many different properties of matter, not just one. While MRI machines might not be able to create an electron density map of the body, they can create T1 relaxation time maps of the body. And T1 relaxation time is an inherent property of matter, just like density or thermoconductivity. And T1 relaxation time varies in different tissues. For example, the T1 relaxation time in normal liver tissue might be around 500 milliseconds, while the T1 relaxation time of liver tumors may be around 900 to 1,000 milliseconds. MRI machines can also create T2 relaxation time maps of the body. T2 relaxation time is a different inherent property of matter. In fact, MRI machines can create image maps of many other properties of matter too, um, like proton density or water content or fat content or the amount of Brownian motion, and the list goes on. We'll give different sequences of instructions to the magnets and electrical circuits inside the MRI machine if we wanted to do, say, a T1 relaxation time image map versus um, a proton density image map. These different sequences of instructions to the MRI machine have different names. Uh, for example, the sequence of instructions for creating a T1 relaxation time image map is 
quite prosaic, we call it a T1 weighted sequence. Well, the sequence of instructions for creating a water content map may be called a short tau inversion recovery sequence, um, which we often abbreviate as STIR. All of these different sequences share one thing in common. They're all about imaging hydrogen atoms. But what makes each sequence distinct from each other is that each sequence emphasizes different populations of hydrogen atoms in the body, which is what allows us to create image maps of different properties, such as T1 relaxation time, proton density, fat content, etc., instead of only one. Now, when we read a CT, uh, pathology may often present as a deviation in the grayscale quote, color uh, in a structure. For example, bone that's normally white may appear focally dark gray if there's a lytic metastasis. So reading a CT therefore requires us to know what the grayscale colors of different structures normally are so that we can recognize when there's a change. For example, we expect normal liver to appear bright gray, normal air spaces in the lungs to be practically black, and normal bone marrow to be very light gray. Remembering the normal grayscale colors of structures in the body isn't too tough since we're exposed to X-ray images um, all the time um, outside of medicine, say even on TV shows. So all of us have had a head start internalizing these uh, normal colors, if you will, practically since we were kids watching TV. Recognizing abnormalities on MRI, however, can be a lot trickier. Where different structures normally fall along the grayscale spectrum from white to black is not always as intuitive as it is on CT. And these patterns can be different on one MR sequence versus another MR sequence. The naming conventions of all of the different MR sequences can also further complicate matters. And I like to explain this using an analogy from the ph pharmaceutical industry. Here in the United States, there's a, pos there's a popular NSAID whose generic name is ibuprofen. Now, if you walked into a pharmacy and wanted to purchase name brand non-generic ibuprofen, you'll see ibuprofen branded as Advil from the vendor Pfizer. Um, you'll see ibuprofen branded as Motrin um, from the vendor McNeil uh, or Nuprin uh, if the vendor is Shasin. Um, if you wanted to purchase a formulation of ibuprofen targeted to women with menstrual cramping, you might see ibuprofen branded as Midol from Bayer. Uh, now, let's look at an MRI sequence that creates T1-weighted images. While the sequence may go by the generic name, quote, volume interpreted gradient echo, radiologists may often refer to the sequence by the shorthand brand name the vendor who made the MRI machine gives to it. Since vendors often uh, like shorter, easier to pronounce snazzy acronyms um, like Vibe or Lava, Thrive or Tiger, um, which can be easier to say, especially when you're chatting about lots of them at the same time if you're a technologist. Things can get, however, confusing though when you're dealing with a department or practices where there are multiple MRIs machines from multiple vendors. I should add that this tends to be less of an issue with classic MRI sequences that have been around since, say, the like 1980s, as these oldest sequences tend to be called the same thing by every vendor. So what's the TLDR? Well, the world of MRI can seem more complex than the world of CT. You've got numerous ways of looking at the tissues in the body with MRI instead of just one with CT. Uh, it's sort of like experiencing the world around you with multiple senses instead of only one sense. The catch is um, with MRI that the nomenclature situation can get gnarly and the normal grayscale color of different organs may not be as intuitive when you're first getting started reading MRI. Now, let's talk about how we put all of the different MR sequences available to us in use in the real world. Although we've got lots of sequences to choose from, the microscopic and molecular structure of different organs can be very different from each other, and an MR sequence that's very helpful for, say, studying the brain may not be helpful at all for studying a different organ like the liver. So the assortment of MR sequences we'll use when studying one body part will typically be different than the assortment we'll use for a different body part. Assembling these assortments of MR sequences to study a body part is called MR protocoling. 
Protocoling requires us to decide which combination of imaging sequences will answer our question as effectively and as efficiently as possible, and how large a region of the body will get imaged. Our decisions about MR sequences will be influenced by three different attributes of every sequence. Is the acquisition two-dimensional or three-dimensional? How long does it take? And how good or poor is the spatial resolution of the images that it will generate? We care about the coverage of an MRI sequence. Let's say we're studying the chest and need to be um, need to be sure that the entire volume in this orange cylinder is imaged. If a sequence isn't able to image a volume large enough to cover our entire volume of interest, we may need to run the sequence twice, capturing the top half of the chest first and then the bottom half of the chest on the second go around. We need to mind how each MR sequence acquires anatomy. Some sequences acquire a 3D volume when they're run. With a volumetric acquisition, the voxels are the same size in all dimensions, so you can view the volume in any plane you want afterwards, whether it's axial or coronal or sagittal. However, there are many other MR sequences that can only be acquired two-dimensionally, one slice at a time. While you'll get a nice, slash, sl nice stack of images when you're done, like this axial MRI series here, what happens if you need to view uh, the anatomy in a different plane, uh, like say a coronal one? Since the MRI slices tend to be thicker than CT slices and more like slabs, a coronal MPR built using these axial acquisitions will look like this, which isn't optimal. So, if axial and coronal images of this sequence are important to you, you'll have to run this sequence twice, once in the axial plane and once a second time in the coronal plane. So you'll get a much nicer coronal image that looks like this. Just look at the difference between coronal reformatted, coronal reformatted images from axial seat, um, 2D acquisitions of the chest versus direct coronal images from a coronal 2D acquisition of the chest. The TLDR is we need to think ahead and determine what planes we'll want to review our images in. And if the sequence in question can only be acquired two-dimensionally, we need to do an additional pass in the plane we want while the patient is still inside our MR machine. We need to mine how long it takes to run each MR sequence. While CT is a very fast imaging modality where acquisitions take no more than a few seconds usually, MR sequences can take longer. While some MR sequence, uh, sequences can take seconds, others can sometimes take minutes. You can have a 3D volumetric acquisition that takes several minutes or a 2D acquisition that by itself takes a couple seconds but requires lots of slices or slabs to completely capture your region of interest. With acquisitions that take a long time, issues like breathing and patient movement or fidgeting become concerns we need to work around. Thirdly, we need to mind how the resolution of the images an MRI sequence will yield is. The spatial resolution of CT images is usually quite excellent and almost always better than the spatial resolution of MR images. Some MR sequences churn out images that aren't too bad from a spatial resolution standpoint, like this one, while others turn out images with spatial resolution considerably lower than we're accustomed to on CT. So, good MR protocoling requires the radiologist to pick which sequences and how many of them we need to answer our question efficiently and effectively. We have to decide which sequences we need, since different sequences permit us to study different molecular aspects of a body part. We have to decide if a sequence will capture enough territory or will we need to run it twice. We have to decide which planes some sequences need to be run in if they can only be acquired two-dimensionally. We need to decide how our choices will affect the entire duration of the study since the duration may affect image quality because a patient may not be able to hold still or last long enough in the MR machine. And we need to decide how image resolution will affect our ability to answer the question. With so many factors, expect different radiologists to come up with slightly different answers. 
That's why MR protocols for the same body part often can vary a bit between different radiologists and different practices. Now, let's show you how we make protocoling decisions for chest MRI in our section. For non-cardiac chest MRI, we can usually get everything we need done with eight sequences. Six sequences do not require contrast, and two sequences, the two bottom ones in yellow on this table, are done with contrast. Let's describe these sequences. Volume interpreted gradient echo images are acquired as a 3D volume, take time to acquire, but offer good image resolution. Half Fourier acquired single shot turbo spin echo images are acquired as 2D slabs, fast, but offer poor image resolution. True fast imaging with steady state precession is also acquired as 2D slabs, fast, and provides fair image resolution. Dixon method chemical shift images are acquired as 2D slabs, slow, but offer good image resolution. Short tau, um, short tau inversion recovery images are acquired as 2D slabs, slow, and offer fair image resolution. Diffusion weighted images are acquired as 2D slabs, slow, and offer poor image resolution. The two conscious enhanced sequences we used are volume interpolated gradient echo, which is a 3D volumetric acquisition that's slow but provides good image resolution, and the other sequence is a time-resolved MRA, which is also a 3D volumetric acquisition that trades speed for poor image resolution. Anytime our protocol calls for one of the five sequences that are acquired as 2D acquisitions, we'll need to specify to our technologist if, um, in which planes we need, axial, coronal, and or sagittal. Now, each of these eight sequences serves a distinct purpose. We use volume interpolated gradient echo images to assess anatomic structure and morphology. To me, reading them is the closest analog to reading non-contrast CT images. If I'm gonna pick up a long nodule on MRI, this is probably gonna be the sequence I'll have the best chance of seeing it on. We use half Fourier acquired single shot turbo spin echo images to pick up lung consolidation and any other pathology that's associated with abnormally increased water content. We use true fast imaging with steady state precession to view macroscopic motion. It can let us see flow in large vessels without intravenous contrast or allow us to do motion capture and see how different tissue planes move relative to each other, um, say during a respiratory cycle. We use Dixon method chemical shift imaging to pick up differences in fat water content in tissues. And we use short tau inversion recovery images to pick up lymphadenopathy and abnormal bone marrow lesions. Diffusion weighted imaging is good for picking up dense tumors, such as lymphoma. Um, our contrast enhanced volume interpolated gradient echo images help us pick up abnormally hypervascular tissue, which like on CT is often indicative of inflammation or neoplasm. And our time-resolved MRA sequence is a nice angiographic technique. As I've been going through this table, you've probably noticed, I've been assiduously using the generic names of all of these imaging sequences. And you've also likely noticed that they're quite a mouthful. That's why in real life, we'll usually use the vendor-specific branded acronyms for these sequences. Since we're a Siemens shop, I refer to the first sequ uh, six sequences as the Vibe, Haste, True Fisp, Dixon, Stir, and Diffusion images. And I refer to the contrast enhanced sequences as the post contrast Vibe and Twist images. Now, let's show you our protocols. There's a baseline set of workhorse sequences we'll get on every chest MRI, regardless of the clinical indication. Those are pre and post contrast vibe images and haste images acquired in the axial and coronal plane. These give us a chance to look at anatomical structure and morphology, abnormal enhancement, and pick up areas with abnormally increased water content or edema, which is often an indicator for pathology in the body. If the indication of the chest MRI is lymphoma, we'll tack on a couple of additional sequences in green here to our workhorse sequences. Since STIR and diffusion images are good at picking up lymphadenopathy, 
dense tumors, and marrow lesions will include stir and diffusion acquisitions in the axial plane. We don't need to acquire these in other planes since in our experience, they wouldn't add much diagnostic value and would only serve to make the study longer and the patient more uncomfortable. We'll also add true FISP acquisitions in three planes to get a look at the large vessels in the chest and perhaps additional insight into any mass effective present. Commonly used MRI protocols are usually packaged and named so that you can communicate all the sequences you need by just saying, quote, lymphoma protocol, unquote, rather than listing a litany of sequences. Now let's uh, talk about how we protocol for anterior mediastinal masses. Now, many anterior mediastinal masses are lymphoma, so it makes sense that we build off of the lymphoma protocol, which was this. But another common differential diagnosis we often need to rule in or rule out um, is mass-like thymic hyperplasia with an anterior mediastinal mass. Diagnosing thymic hyperplasia requires us to find evidence of microscopic fat in an anterior mediastinal mask, a task Dixon method chemical shift imaging is good at. So for an anterior mediastinal mass workup, we'll add an, an axial Dixon to our protocol. If the indication of the chest MRI is PE, we'll take the workhorse sequences in magenta here and add true FISP sequences in two oblique coronal planes parallel to the right and left pulmonary arteries and a twist MRA sequence. The true FISP gives us a chance to pick up central PE if something goes wrong with the twist acquisition. With these three examples, hopefully you can see how the protocoling of chest MRI studies is a more intricate process than protocoling chest CT, and that MR protocoling requires familiarity with the different MR sequences, what they're good at, and also their limitations. Now, one last tip before we finish. How do you recognize if an image you're being shown is a CT or an MR image? Look at the margins of the bones, where the bone cortex is. If the bone cortex looks white, you're looking at a CT. If the bone cortex looks black or very dark gray, you're looking at an MRI. And remember, that's because dense calcium blocks X-ray beams well, but contains few hydrogen atoms for you to do MR imaging with.